Uh, so we are going through our, I think, our fourth week of summer youth, or uh, summer series here at Mesquite. Third, got it. Third week here. I'm sorry, I'm with the teenagers uh, a lot, and I'm losing my mind. Um, and so the topic for the summer series is the names of God. And so I have the pleasure, the esteemed pleasure, of introducing uh, my very good friend Luke Quinn uh, to talk about one of these names. So I've known Luke for about 15 or 16 years. He is Kaylee's cousin. Uh, their, their moms are sisters. Uh, we met each other back in Georgia um, when he was, what, 13 years old, I think. Um, great guy sometimes. Uh, I tolerate him. He tolerates me. Great friendship. Um, his education background, he's a graduate of the Memphis School of Preaching and the Georgia School of Preaching. He has a bachelor's degree in Bible from Amridge University, uh, and he's studying to get his master's in counseling from the same university. He uh, has spent some time in the mission field in Micronesia and Pompeii, island of Pompeii. He's been a preacher up in Wisconsin, uh, two hours north of Madison, and now he preaches uh, two hours north of Jackson, Mississippi, in a town called Greenwood, Mississippi, cotton capital of the world, uh, where he is there with his wife and their three and almost four children. Uh, his wife, Laura, is pregnant. They're expecting another boy. She made it public, so I guess I could say it. Okay. Yay. They're staying with us, and so uh, if she kills me later, then that's because I wasn't supposed to say that. Um, so he's, he's come to speak many times before on our winter retreat a couple years back um, here for multiple occasions, and so he's welcome back again to speak on one of the names of God. I hope you uh, welcome him. I hope you learn a lot. I benefit greatly from being around him. So uh, Luke, stage is yours. Well, good evening. Lovely to be back. I uh, have been speaking at this uh, summer series uh, for three years now, and uh, nobody's ever asked me back that many times before, so that's a record for me. In fact, I don't think anyone's ever asked me to speak on a summer series before you guys either, so I guess you gave me my break. But I've really enjoyed getting to know some of you as, as I come here. I've enjoyed getting to know your young people. You have an excellent group of young people, and since I'm always staying with Richard, I get to see them quite a lot uh, whenever I come here. And so, yes, you have an excellent group of young people, um, a lovely congregation. I always enjoy coming here, so thank you very much. So we are here to talk about the names of God, and my specific name that, that I've been given is the Lord My Righteousness. But I was thinking about the significance of the topic in general, the significance of, well, the significance not just of God's name, but the significance of names. I mean, to name something is, in some sense, to cause it to be, at least in your understanding, right? I mean, you know that something exists, and you know that it exists apart from anything else because you have a name for it. And when you do understand something in such a way, you sort of acquire the ability to, to move it, to control it. You know, for instance, in the sciences, we, we designate nature, right? We say this is an animal, this is a vegetable, this is a mineral. And there are important properties that distinguish them, and, and we can only really understand the, those d distinctions when we've applied names to them. And this is also true, let's say, in, in the field of... Um, say, psychology and counseling, because someone's suffering, let's say, from depression, but if they don't know what depression is as a distinct idea, then it can be very hard to deal with. And that's one good thing about having someone objective who can help you understand what your problems are, can help you go through that. And once you have a name, say, depression, for instance, then you can do something about that because you know what it is. So to name things is to give you some sort of control over it. So this ability to understand and therefore to manipulate is, is I think, one reason why, I don't know if you read much, many fairy tales, but I've read fairy tales my whole life and I've always noticed 
that a lot of times a fairy will show up or a leprechaun or whatever it is, some sort of fae, and uh, he won't tell the main character his real name. And I always wondered what was behind that. Why, why is it that they don't tell you the name? If you remember the, the very famous tale, Rumpelstiltskin, uh, Rumpelstiltskin was going to take the queen's firstborn son as the result of a deal they had. And he said, if you can guess my name, then you don't have to give me your firstborn son. And she guessed, of course, that it, she found out that it was Rumpelstiltskin. And so that took away his power. And I think there's an interesting idea behind that. The, you could see the fairy as a sort of representation of a force of nature, either physical or psychological. And a force of nature, once it's named, can be controlled by man. Once you name a physical or psychological force, you can, to some degree, manipulate it. And, and I think it's interesting to think about how potent names are. For instance, if in, uh, do any of you in here have a mother that when she's especially angry at you will use your middle name? And that will have, yes, that's right. So that will have quite a lot of effect on you, right? Luckily, my mother never did that. She just smacked me in the face. That was different, a different type of power. <laughs> but, you know, perhaps your mother will say, Luke Connor Quinn, you come in here, right? I mean, that's, that's funny because that's, that's the, the extreme case. And that has power over you when you hear your full name spoken. So that's fascinating how powerful names are. But on the other hand, to know a person's name is not only to possess the capability of exceptional influence, it's also to possess a very special intimacy. You know my name. That means to some degree you know me. And when you begin a friendship, the first thing you do is you want to know that person's designation. You want to know who that person is. And you begin that process by learning the person's name. And I think this is why, if you extract this out and apply it to what we're talking about here, this is why Moses asked God in Exodus 33, 18, show me your glory that I may know you. And God said in verses 17 and then in 19, he says, I know you, Moses, by name, and I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim before you my name. So God knows the name of man. He knows us intimately, and he wants man to know his name. He wants our relationship with himself to be reciprocal, amazingly even, in some sense, equal. I want to know your name, Moses says. I want to see your face. He wants to see God, to identify him, to commune with him, to see him face to face, not as a servant, but as a loved one. And here at once, I think, is the fundamental human desire for what we call the beatific vision and for the intimate contemplation of God, a desire which is set to be fulfilled at the end of time, in the last day. And speaking of this last day uh, and of those who will inherit eternal life, John says in Revelation 22.4, they will see his face and his name will be written on their brows. So then, not only is it man's highest good to know the name of God, but it's man's highest good to internalize that name, to make it his own, and thus to be identified with it, to have it written on his very brow. But the question is, what's his name? What's the name of God? You know, in the beginning, God actually brought the whole universe into existence by naming it. In uh, Genesis 1-3, the literal translation of it is, God said or God called light, and light was. To me, said J.R.R. Tolkien, a name comes first and the story follows. So God says light and light was. The name came first and the story came after that what light is, what light does in this world. This is Adam, this is man, this is Eve, the mother of all the living. Real names tell you the story of the things they belong to. And this naming process is, of course, performed by the Word of God. The Word is this ability to name things, to designate things. That's who, the, as we call it, the second person of the Godhead is, the Logos, the Word. And He is that which has formed the entire heavens and the earth, and He's done so through naming. But not only that, but once God formed the, the basic categories of the world, once he named existence, he actually gave that task of further delineating it through a system of classifying names, and he gave that task to man. If you remember in Genesis 2.19, it says that out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and whatever he called the, every living creature, that was its name. So this is really the fundamental human task, to name the universe. 
That is how he will be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. It's also his task, I think, to name himself, as Adam named his wife, and the pair of them named their children, and so on. It's on the basis of this empirical process of understanding and classifying the mundane that mankind works his way up and becomes truly conscious of the divine. But just as man begins by naming the beasts and naming himself, so it was only a matter of time, Genesis 4, when he was able to begin calling on the name of the Lord. But again, what's the name? In Exodus 3, Moses asks this question. He asks God, when you send me to these people, to Israel, and they ask, who's sending you? What shall I tell them? What's your name? And God says in Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. <laughs> and there are many things one can make of this designation, but I am is fundamentally a refusal to be named. Say, who are you? I am. But I think it's also a challenge. The fact is, God is the ultimate source of all named things. And therefore, he has many names. He is. He exists and therefore shares at least one quality with every other existent thing and is the substance by which all things obtain that quality. Thus, I am tells you nothing, perhaps, but on the other hand, it tells you everything. It's a challenge to live life experiencing its particulars. The more you see of the things which exist, the more you understand of existence. He is, but he's what? Well, he's the Lord who led us out of Egypt. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the living. He's a mighty warrior. He's a devoted lover. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's father. He's a friend. Or as you all have been or will be talking about uh, during this summer, he is Adonai, my master, Elohim, my creator, Nisi, my banner, Shama, my abiding presence, Makadesh, my sanctifier, Rohi, my shepherd, Shalom, my peace, El Shaddai, my supplier, Rofe, my healer, and he is Tzidkenu, my righteousness. And it's only at the very end of our God-given experience on this earth that mankind may finally be able to put all of God's partially descriptive names together in our hearts and find out what is that ultimate, transcendent, divine name. And when that sweet and divine knowledge has pierced our souls, then we shall be changed, for we shall be like him, because we shall see him and know him as he is. And so, as one small contribution to this task, let's turn our attention briefly this evening to that one designation of God, the Lord, my righteousness. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 6, Jeremiah says, In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. So I guess the first thing we should do is figure out what righteousness is, what it means. And a very helpful synonym for me is justice. Because as it's used in the scriptures, righteousness and justice are fairly commonly interchangeable. So you could think of it that way. The idea essentially is, is the quality of being morally right or justifiable. In Genesis 15, 16, Abraham believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. So he's morally right because of his faith in God. In Romans 1, 16 and 17, Paul, in speaking about the gospel, says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous or the just shall live by faith. All right, so the gospel reveals God's righteousness. righteousness. It reveals that quality in him of being morally right and justifiable. And so that's also what happens to us when we obey the gospel. When we put our faith in it, then we are just. The righteous, the just, lives by his faith. So this is a, a quality which makes you morally right. And what we see here is that it's also a primary characteristic of God. In Matthew 5, 6 Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So it's something we're supposed to desire very greatly. In Matthew 6, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So it's of primary importance. Now, 
that's a good introduction of what justice or righteousness is, but there's, a, there's been a dispute throughout history as to how you really should define it and what justice really is, whether it's something that's real. You know, because there is that idea that might makes right, right? Um, it's a long, there's a long history of thinkers throughout the world who have thought that there really is no, there is no objective system of justice. It's just whoever's in power gets to decide what's right and wrong. And you see a lot of politicians acting as if that's the case, even if they, don't, they say they don't believe that. It's a very tempting thing to believe, of course, because once you have power, you can change anything you want to, perhaps. So the fundamental, I would say, contribution of Christianity to the West has been this idea that even the most powerful person in a society has someone else that he answers to. You know? I mean, Caesar doesn't make law. He doesn't make what's right. He can make laws, perhaps, or decrees, and he can enforce things or refuse to enforce them. But objectively, he does things which are right, but he could also do things which are wrong. And that standard is beyond him, even though he's the most powerful man that anyone knows about. So that's what justice is, is following that natural law. Justice really is the organizing principle of, let's say, a state. Also, it's the organizing principle of a, of a family. It's going even further than that. It's the organizing principle of the self and is the proper enactment of God's natural law. I think one of the best and most detailed, I would say, definitions of justice comes from Plato's Republic, in which he writes, that the, and this is, I would say, what you might call personal justice, justice as it exists in, in a self. He says that the just man does not permit the several elements within him to interfere with one another. He sets in order his own inner life and, his own, and is his own master and his own law and at peace with himself. And when he has bound together the, the principles within him and is no longer many, but has become one entirely temperate and perfectly adjusted nature, then he proceeds to act. If he has to act, whether in a manner of property or in the treatment of the body or in some affair of politics or private business, always thinking and calling that which preserves and cooperates with this harmonious condition just and good action. And the knowledge which presides over it, wisdom. And that which at any time impairs this condition, he will call unjust action. And the opinion which presides over it, ignorance. So if you do something which is wrong, you are being unjust to yourself. Because just, let's say, justice within yourself is a type of personal equilibrium. Now that, that applies large, beyond the self though, right? I mean, it can apply to you because you sort of exist in relationship to yourself. Human beings are very complicated creatures and there are a lot of facets to us. We are just and righteous when we put all those things in proper alignment. But that expands further out, right? I mean, how do you tell you're in proper alignment? Well, you can tell that by how you treat other people. Because your relationship to other people has to have that quality of justice as well. Now, how far does that go? Well, that's my sense of what politics really is, at least what it should be. When you say the word politics, you may have a lot of different associations. But when I think of politics, I think, I think of justice in the public sphere all of a, pe a, a people who live in the general vicinity and their interactions with each other. Justice in the public sphere is, I would say, the natural result of personal justice. For politics is rightly understood the public practice of morality. And I think you can find that, for instance, in, in our country, the Founding Fathers based their ideas on the rights, the natural rights of men, on the natural law, the justice inherent within God. You know, the idea of having the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness isn't something conferred on to people by any government or any man. It's something that is given to you by, as the Declaration of Independence says, nature's God, right? So you're talking about something which is beyond us. It's an organizing, balancing principle, and we have to apply it not just to ourselves individually, but to our relationships with each other. Okay, but what about what about social justice? Because that's a term that came to my head when I was studying all of this and thinking about it. You know, because that's, that's a term you, you, you hear used quite a lot. Justice is in there, but there's, a, there's another indicator there. It's, it's not political justice per se. It's, it's not personal, but it's, it's social. So what's the difference? And is that a legitimate thing? Well, Jesus said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
Matthew 22, 39. As far as I'm concerned, that's what social justice is. At least that's, if you take the term itself, justice in society, justice to the people in your society, that love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Now, any sort of right action or, or a right set of beliefs like that, if it's taken too far and made the, let's say, the top of the hierarchy of values, can actually create injustice. And that's, that's the fascinating thing about justice and morality. You can take something which is good. You can take a good idea, for instance. But if you make it the idea over all ideas, if you make it the name by which everything else is named, right? The name above all names. If you, if you take an idea and do that, then it actually creates injustice. It does the opposite of what the person originally intended, the opposite of what it was designed to do. So when you think about justice, it, it's, something that, it's something that starts within the soul of man, but it always exists in relationship. And, and it's, it's something that primarily is about balance. So that's what you might say a, a, a working that is a working definition of what justice or righteousness is. All right, but why do we call God our righteousness? And we've been talking about a human being being just. Could, could not a human being be just without God? How is it that God is our righteousness? What does that mean? Well, I think one thing that's important to consider about this is God's relationship to himself. And God also is a complex being, if you haven't noticed. God exists and has several elements within himself. We call them the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is, as we commonly say, a divine community. And so that justice within him shows a perfect balance, a perfect balance within himself. As it says in Psalm 11:7, the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. In Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, Paul says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So this is a characteristic that God has within himself. And God's justice exists within his persons, let's say. He has his own divine inner life in perfect order. However, that being said, his justice is revealed to us in his relation not with himself, but with man. I mean, and I think it's kind of interesting. We, we talk about God in relationship to himself, God as he exists in himself, but we really don't know anything about that because we can't experience that. We're human beings. What we know of God is how he's revealed himself to us. And, and that's where we start to understand what it means that he is our righteousness and that he is a just God, is how he's treated us. We understand God's justice in relationship to us through the natural law. And I think that idea of a, a, a law in nature, and I, I don't mean by that, let's say, the law of gravity or something like that. I mean the law of nature, such as certain moral principles that most everyone would share, or even this idea that there, is, there are some things that are wrong and there are some things that are right. That's what you might call the natural law. Um, Roger Scruton was a, an Englishman who wrote a book, excellent book, called The Face of God. And, and he said something about that that I think was really interesting. He said, God's freedom is revealed in the laws that bind us and by which he too is bound, since it would be a loss of God's freedom and not a gain were he to defy the laws that govern the created world and which spell out his providence. So the idea is that God is somehow, somehow submits himself to the laws that he makes. Now, Perhaps this is an incomplete view of God's relationship to natural law. Perhaps these laws are not so much causal for God as the codified explanations of what he does. I mean, they flow from God as they are, but at any minute, it's possible that something different could come from him. In other words, the rules could change. Now, that's debatable, but in fact, some claim that this is precisely what happened, in which case, God doesn't obey laws so much as he uses tools and different tools may be used to suit different purposes. And I think this is the key to why, from our perspective, God can sometimes seem unjust. And maybe you think, what are you talking about? God doesn't ever seem unjust. Well, what about Job? 
I mean, what about all the sufferings that we go through? I mean, don't we ask God, why did you let this happen? And, and if we assume that we could ask God that question, then maybe we also assume that he could have done it differently or maybe that he should have. I mean, the, the question of God's justice is just that. It's a question. It's a question that we answer throughout our lives or at least that we ask. I think God can seem unjust sometimes. This is actually, I would say, the, the reason behind Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9, starting verse 15, Paul says, For God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So it's really Pharaoh's whole life was about God proclaiming his glory. Pharaoh was used as a tool. That's what's being said here. And so then, Paul concludes, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. All right, so here's the question. Could we do that? Could I have mercy on who I want to and not have mercy on who I want to? No, I have to show mercy to everyone. That's how I feel, at least, and I think most people would agree. You need, the, the quality of mercy is something that I have to have in me all the time. I can't make the decision as to whether I should forgive someone, let's say, who's penitent, as opposed to not forgive them. I don't have that power, but it says that God can have mercy on whomever he wills. And so here's the question that Paul asks. Will you say to me then, why does he still find fault? I mean, who could resist his will? If his will is all that there is, if it's just what he wants, and there's no law, let's say, that keeps him at bay, then why would he ever find fault with me? And I think this is basically the question that Job asked of God. Why does it seem that your blessings and your retributions are random, and that the good people often suffer while the wicked often prosper? And I have said before, I think, or I've thought before, that, that the book of Job is kind of a combination of, of two worldviews. One is the Proverbs, and the other is Ecclesiastes. Job's friends sort of try to defend God, and they have a very optimistic view of life. It's like the Proverbs. It says, the righteous will prosper and the wicked will perish. That's how it is. And so, Job, if you're suffering, you must be one of the wicked people. And Job says, no, I'm not. I didn't do anything to deserve what happened to me. So what about that? That's sort of the Ecclesiastes worldview. Sometimes the wicked prosper and the righteous perish. So what do you do with that? God tells Job something very similar to what Paul concludes in Romans 9. The answer basically is this. Who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? <laughs> it sounds harsh, but I mean, fair enough. God is who he is, and we're not him. We don't understand what he understands. We don't see things as he sees them. But, but still, our relationship to God and our understanding of his justice is... It's... If, if it's necessary that he show us who he is. Right? It's almost like we want God to justify himself to us. Uh, why, why else would we look at good things that happen and say we should praise God for it? You know, why else, do, when we see good things or beautiful things, we do thank God for them? We want to think that God is good, and perhaps we do think that. I think that's a good thing to think. But it's still a challenge for us because bad things happen too and it's very hard for us not to say God did that too. Job said when he first encountered all of his terrible sufferings, shall I accept the good from the Lord and not the bad? The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What else can you say? And yet, that's not enough for us, is it? I mean, I don't know about you, but when I read the book of Job and God comes in and tells Job, Pretty much, you need to be quiet because you don't know what's going on here. I think that's not enough for me. I think there's got to be something more, right? There's an answer to Job, perhaps? Well, I think that there is. But I don't think it was given to Job. I think it was given to all of us. And it wasn't given in the book of Job. It was given in the Gospels. See, this, what we've been talking about, is not the only aspect we see of God. There's something very important about how we perceive him and, and interact with him. And Roger Scruton continues and says that God is a person, an agent, an I, 
And he relates to his people through promises, obligations, laws, and covenants, all of which presuppose that both he and they are free agents, able to change the flow of events, and at the same time, to take responsibility for doing so. God then is free, and he freely limits himself in his covenant with man. He makes a promise, and he keeps it. That's the whole basis for the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. It's a promise, an agreement that God makes, and that he keeps. But you don't see this fulfilled until Christ. But he limits himself within that covenant. He chooses to do so. And it's in this interaction, in this interaction, is evident his justice. A quality which can only exist in relationship. And it's the foundational relationship between the human and the divine, which serves as the bedrock for all other human relationships, and therefore for every other type of justice. So, man's righteousness is found in God. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one, says Paul in Romans 3.10. And he says in Philippians 3.9, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So our righteousness, since it wasn't enough on its own, it has to come from God. God is our righteousness because when we look to him and we see how he's acted with us, we see that anything that's good and true and beautiful about us is to be found in him and in the person of Christ. However, and I want to close with this thought, in a truly mutual relationship, which is what we're wanting, this sort of thing goes both ways. If God is my righteousness, then I'm his. Man obviously leaves much to be desired in the eyes of God. That is evident. That's why we needed him. However, there's another apparent reason for God becoming man and living a truly righteous life. It's not only that man needed his righteousness to be filled in God, I also believe that God needed his righteousness to be fulfilled in man. And granted, as we said, God exists within himself perfectly, righteously. But once he made man and allowed him to suffer the torments and temptations of the devil, he had to do something to justify himself in the eyes of people like Job. In fact, I believe it, that it was in answer to Job that God finally, in the fullness of time, became flesh, took upon himself all the sufferings that he allowed man to endure. Not only that, he justified those sufferings. He made them serve the purpose of ultimate meaning. And now, because of the life of Christ, who is as much man as he is God, our sufferings in this world are a participation in his sufferings. Our very death will lead, like his, into eternal life. And so God has justified his ways to man and fulfilled his obligations and his relationship to us in the human life of Christ. The human life of Christ. That's when we see his righteousness fulfilled. And so God's righteousness is found in man. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be, no, be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's an amazing thing that God has done. Job lamented the fact that God was too high and powerful to stand at the bar of natural law with any mere human being, and yet that which is highest took the form of a servant and submitted himself to all the injustices of men. And in doing so, God has justified Job's sufferings and therefore the sufferings of the entire world. And not only that, but he's made it so that both man and God are righteous in their relationship to each other. Truly, now we can say, that God is our righteousness, and God can say that man is his. That's why, in addition to all the names by which we name the Lord, we also call him our righteousness. <laughs> Shakespeare said that a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, but somehow I think that any other name wouldn't quite do its justice or tell its story. Good names aren't arbitrary, arbitrarily fixed to random objects. They're born of a towering lineage, and they come from he who has named all things, the Word of God, Christ himself, and he will, at the end of time, name us. So you think you have a name, but your story is not over yet. Christ is completing it, and at the end of time, it says in Revelation 2.17, he will give each of us a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives him. For the story of the entire world is contained within his being, such that his name is above every name. 
It is at the top of, even beyond every hierarchy, and all other names point to it, either positively or negatively, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father.